The Mill Owner's Daughter Chapter 7 Ray, what next, Michael? The small organising committee for the Trace Delegate Conference occupied an upstairs room in the Griffin Tavern in Ancoats, reviewing progress on the election of delegates and general preparations. Michael O'Donnell chaired the meeting, which consisted of James Leach, Thomas Abbott, representing the Warpers, George Adfield, the Spinners and Stretchers, Daniel Donovan, the Powerloom Overlookers, and Peter Fraser from the Steam Engine Makers. Hall hailed from Manchester, save Thomas, who lived in nearby Mouse Platting. Michael had provided the committee with a report of the activities on Mottram Moor the previous day, based on the information he'd received from Irene Rose. There had actually been two mass meetings, the first at ten o'clock in the morning, addressed by four speakers, William Muirhouse, the bellman, George Candler, Emma Lopperty, Robert Wilde, Occupation Unknown, and William Stevenson, a shoemaker. All were from Hyde, apart from Stevenson, who was from Staley Bridge, and all were Chartists, apart from Robert Wilde. The meeting determined to fight for a return to the wage rates of 1839, in effect a wage increase, for the ten-hour day and the charter to be made the law of the land. It sent runners to the nearby towns of Ashton Underline, Staley Bridge, Duggenfield and Hyde for a later meeting that day to ensure wider representation. At the second meeting held at two o'clock, which Irene Rose attended, Thomas Storer, a weaver from Ashton Underline, Thomas Mahone, a shoemaker from Staley Bridge, John Leach, a tailor from Hyde and no relation to James Leach, and John Crossley from Staley Bridge augmented the previous speakers. These two were Chartists, and despite an attempt to separate the demands of the Charter from the question of wages and hours, the workers overwhelmingly reaffirmed the decisions of the first meeting. They also resolved to march to Hyde the next day, to win the town for a mass turnout, and to Manchester the day after. Daniel Donovan reported mass meetings had taken place at All Green in Duckenfield on the 2nd or 3rd of August, he wasn't sure which, and at Hague on the 5th. Here, two meetings had taken place, one in the morning and one in the evening. A further meeting had been held at the same venue the next day, presumably as a result of the evening meeting. Michael informed the committee a total of 69 delegates had been elected so far, representing a wide range of trades, including boot and shoemakers, calico printers, colliers, cord wainers, cotton spinners, cotton power loom weavers, dressers and dyers, factory operatives, fustian cutters, fustian power loom weavers, grinders and strippers, hammer men, hand loom weavers, hatters, labourers, moulders and foundry workers, Mule spinners, pieces, plumbers and glaziers, power loom overlookers, rope and twine makers, silk weavers, steam engine makers, tailors, warpers, wheelwrights and blacksmiths, and last but not least, the wire drawers and card makers. The delegates came from a wide number of towns around Manchester, including Ashton Underline, Berry, Bolton, Clayton, Duckenfield, Drawlsden, Eccles, Hyde, Glossop, Lee. Middleton, Mouse Platting, Patrickroft, Salford, Rochdale, Staley Bridge and Stockport. The committee pinpointed weaknesses in the Lancashire towns of Accrington, Colne, Nelson and Rottenstall, and the Cheshire town of Macclesfield, and resolved to send delegates there the next day. Additionally, they resolved to make contact with trade unions and charities further afield, including Preston, Liverpool, Birmingham, Lancaster and Glasgow, the steelmakers in Sheffield, and the wool textile workers of the West Riding of Yorkshire. Peter Fraser, the representative of the steam engine makers, insisted once a mill or factory turned out, some of the workers should remain to control events and prevent the owners drafting in alternative labour. He outlined simple measures that could be taken to foil such attempts. He also emphasised the need to keep essential services going. For example, he argued pimp pumps should be taken over by colliers to prevent the mine workings flooding, and they should ensure pit props were replaced to prevent seams collapsing. 
He also argued that essential supplies must be maintained and on no account must agricultural workers or any workers connected with food provision be involved in strike action. His points were agreed by the committee without dissension. By the time Michael brought the meeting to a close, all present were far more confident with the progress of events than hitherto. However, there remained plenty of time for further unconsidered drama to unfold. They were in an unprecedented situation, as were all the workers involved. The dispute hadn't been one of their choosing, and certainly not of their timing. A downturn in trade was never a good time to strike, but they knew its outcome depended on the degree to which they could seize the initiative and remove control of events from the mill and factory owners' grasp. Irene Rose had just made a meal for young Daniel with Grace's assistance and was about to sit down with the lad to eat when her father entered the house. Rose, Rose, where are you? I've news. He put his head around the dining room door. There you are, love. I thought you'd be in the library. No, father, I'm here as you can see. But why are you so excited? Where's Michael? He has a meeting, father. He'll be home about nine with a bit of luck. Where will he be? I think it might be useful if I give him this information tonight. I'm not sure, but I think they're holding all their committee meetings at the Griffin on Great Angolt Street. But he may be out of town. Why don't you tell me what you know? You look fit to burst. Take your hat and coat off and I'll pour you some tea. He smiled at her doing as she said. He turned to Daniel. Forgive me, young man. I didn't mean to be rude. I'm just overexcited. Rather silly at my age, don't you think? How are you, my boy? I'm fine, Uncle Matthew, the lad replied. There you are, father. Mind you don't burn your lips. Matthew nodded, pouring the milk. What time's Daniel picking up his son? Young Daniel's staying here tonight. He's keeping me company, aren't you, Daniel? Yes, Auntie Rose, the lad agreed with a grin. I thought you were meeting Councillor Davitt today, father, Irene Rose said, changing the subject as he stirred a teaspoon of sugar into his tea. That's where I've come from. That's how I know my theory is correct. Five thousand workers paraded through I today. Every single mill and every factory in the town's closed. Tomorrow they're marching on Manchester, he said, sounding more than a little excited. It's a rolling strike. Staley Bridge, Dugganfield and Ashton are already solid behind the turnout. David says they're expecting at least 7,000 workers to march on Manchester. David can't be pleased. Isn't he a mill owner? No, he owns an engineering workshop, but that's not the point. The manufacturers are pleased. They say the operatives are playing into their hands. Father, the manufacturers are not going to provoke trouble, are they? She responded, sounding concerned. Michael tells me the one thing they are insisting on is that the workers should refrain from any kind of violence. They are quite aware the Tory government will use any excuse to send troops in. No, the corporations instructed Daniel Maud to meet the strikers on the outskirts, accompanied by a large force of police and cavalry as a show of strength, but to allow them access into the town. Daniel Maud? He's a justice of the peace, isn't he? Irene Rose asked. A liberal, appointed by the last Whig government, as I remember. Exactly, Rose. Like the manufacturers and the vast majority of the corporation, they're all liberals and radicals to a man. Except for Burley, father. He's your fly in the ointment. A mill owner, but a Tory through and through. He had a letter in yesterday's Guardian saying the strikers should be put down before they start rioting and calling on Peel to send troops to Manchester. He's out on a limb, Rose, and between you and me there's more than one manufacturer would like to see his premises under attack. Matthew took a sip from his tea and glanced across at young Daniel. The lad continued to concentrate on his meal. I think the manufacturers are in for a surprise, father, particularly those who want repeal of the corn laws. They all want repeal, Rose. Then they're all in for a surprise. Presumably they think the workers will expend their energies marching about and picketing, giving the masters and their press courts time to frighten the government, and then they'll all return to work, tails between their legs. That's the general idea. 
Well, I think they're making a big mistake from what I've been told this afternoon. This strike's going to be well organised. It's going to spread far wider than Manchester, even South East Lancashire and North East Cheshire. The Manchester manufacturers will find themselves asking their workers permission to carry out all kinds of essential tasks pretty soon. Judging by his surprised expression, this was news even the mill owner hadn't anticipated. How do you mean, Rose? Strike committees are issuing licenses to allow essential work to take place. One company in Ashton has requested permission to remove cloth from a vat of dye to prevent it spoiling. They've been given permission, but on the workers' terms. Well, good for them. Mill owners have ruled over their workers with ticket law for far too long. It's time the boot was on the other foot. Have you thought of your own position, father? Of course I have. Aren't you going to tell me? I'm going to pay my operatives as though they're in work. I'm going to give them permission to turn out. You're no different than the rest of your class, really, are you, father? Except by degree, of course. What on earth do you mean? I support my employees. I want them to succeed. I can't see anybody else doing that. Matthew was surprised and stung by his daughter's remark. Neither can I. With the exception of John Fielden at Todmorden, Irene Rose said. I think he may, but that isn't the point. You should take the workers into your confidence, father, and ask them what they want to do. They may want to carry on working. They may want to make an agreement with you to match any money they donate to the strike fund, shilling for a shilling. She waited for him to respond, but as he didn't, she continued to underline her point. It wouldn't cost you any more than if you were paying them for not working. In fact, it would cost you far less, and assist the unions at the same time. After all, the workers produce far more than you pay them in wages, don't they? You could forgo part of your profits. On the other hand, they may wish to accept your offer in order to demonstrate their solidarity, but you should at least consult them. That's my view anyway. Matthew gazed into his daughter's eyes. Once again, Irene Rose had taken him by surprise, and once again she was making sense. The point is, father, nobody's infallible, and the more people take part in discussing the issues at stake and making a decision accordingly, the more likely it will turn out to be a good one. And if it's wrong, a lot more people learn the lesson. Making mistakes is a democratic right, isn't it? If it isn't, it should be. Isn't it one of the means by which we learn at the end of the day? There may be issues you haven't even thought of, no matter how well-meaning you are, or how much consideration you give to a problem. Isn't that one of the lessons Robert Owen learned at New Lanark? It's not sufficient to make decisions for other people, no matter how well-intentioned. You have to involve people in making the decisions that affect them. You know, I think you're right, Rose. I was talking about the cooperative with Mary Upton the other day and congratulated her on its success and the way it's developing. We were talking about obtaining cloth and setting up another workers' cooperative to make clothing for the mill workers instead of the shoddy stuff they have to buy now at extortionate prices. Mary made much the same point as you, explaining the enterprise's success arises in no small part because of the members' involvement in all aspects of decision-making, including the election of their manager. They know the cooperative's theirs. They realise only they can make it successful, and it's in their interest to do so. I hate to say it, Father, but when I borrowed the fifty pounds off you so they could start the enterprise, I did tell you what would happen. Matthew smiled wryly. Yes, I must admit you did. But what really impressed me was something else Mary told me. Evidently, they made a healthy return again this year, but rather than take a full dividend, they agreed to reinvest 65% of their surplus back into the business at their last finance meeting, instead of the normal 35%. Not many mill owners would do that. They reinvest as little as possible and maximise their short-term gains. Irene Rose smiled again, but thought it wise not to say, I told you so, once more. What it proves is that Owen was right, Matthew continued. 
cooperative enterprises are a viable alternative to laissez-faire. Workers are quite capable of running their own businesses, pay themselves a decent wage, and still have leisure time. Irene Rose nodded her agreement. There's something else I should have mentioned, Father. After the meeting on Mottram Moor, I spoke to two of the strike leaders, William Muirhouse and Thomas Storer. Muirhouse chaired the meeting, and in his opening address, made a very important point, which sums the struggle up for me. He told the gathering, I must inform you, we are not here for a wage question or for a religious question. It is a national question. Social peace and happiness is our desire. The people's charter is our means. Once they'd elected their leaders, I told them how Bess Aykroyd had persuaded Lisa Hodgkinson and her husband to make sure the mill engine was put out of action at the Nelson Mill. Yes, I remember. It was astute thinking on Bess's part. It's a tragedy we lost her. She's sorely missed. Nathaniel West should have been brought to justice. It's a damn disgrace. Nobody should get away with murder. Well, I think if you check, Bessie's lesson has been learnt and learnt well. Wherever a turnout's taken place, the workers have removed the main drain plugs from the boilers. Most have been removed and hidden. Those of the most backward employers have been driven into the boiler with sledgehammers. Something made Matthew look across the table at young Daniel. The lad was staring intently at Irene Rose, and he didn't look happy.